Reader Mail for the month of November. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square Day PlayStation Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, Mr. Saw Bridges. Bringing you, come on, Saw. I thought we'd stop this with all the other reader mails. <laughs> Bringing you a lucky episode November, as much as that doesn't make any sense at all. I know. That's what I even wanted you to do it. <laughs> Saul, you know. We're going to just... sound a little bit different. We're certainly going to look a little bit different this episode. If we look like uh... a black triangle squared logo, <laughs> we've died. <laughs> uh okay due to um due to Saul getting off very late and me getting kidney stones and having health issues we've decided to do this one as an audio only very last well, we're minute. doing this we're doing this as a test too we want to see if you guys typically on youtube we get the lowest amount of views per reader mail episode than uh say a podcast service so we want to kind of see if you guys are uh, open to reception on these being uh, audio only or if you like to see our pretty faces uh, kind of let us know that we're going to go off people's feedback on this one uh, if nobody speaks up we're going to assume that audio only is fine I guess because there's no complaints against it but it's a much more relaxed format for us kind of just legs up on the table now you can't see it but boy is it comfy but oh yeah hey brett tell us who they are who, tell us who we normally are <laughs> well if you've not listened to us before which we always say is weird on these episodes then we are triangle square at a playstation podcast we normally come at you in video format on youtube uh, every monday at 10 a.m pst and 12 p.m cst if you like what we're doing here subscribe uh, hit the bell let you know when these new episodes come up like i said every monday and then normally the first friday of every month unless there's some kind of catastrophic problem uh of course you can also listen to us in audio format on google play music itunes any apple or android listening thing or soundcloud if you want to do it from computer all those and we are also on spotify these days so you can find us in a bunch of places there uh, and if you like what we're doing there specifically on itunes consider giving us a review helps us know what we're doing with the show whether you like it what you do and don't like about it and lets us know how to potentially change the show moving forward a lot of changes coming up in the coming weeks uh, uh so some things that we may have that you may have asked us about that we've not done yet uh may be coming so uh, still leave us your thoughts and opinions on the things so we can get a look at them uh, and of course it helps people find us a little bit better which is very fun if you want to talk to us on social media you can find us on twitter at triangle sqrd if you want to find us on facebook there is a group uh, triangle squared a playstation podcast you will find me brett in there but Saul does not have a facebook which i'm actually proud of you know yeah it's very weird for people our age to not have facebook so it's cool that he doesn't in a way i have um, to stand out one way or another yep but also you can find us uh, on discord which is our day-to-day moment-to-moment chat that we like to be in uh, and it's a pretty hectic conversation but they're fun and quick and there's a lot of cool people in that group and we love them uh, so you can find us there we keep that link in the description below on all of these things uh, be it on youtube or on the podcast services uh, and let's see i think with that being said the last thing we have to talk about is patreon if you would like to support us in the show and what we do then you can go over to patreon at nartech gaming that is our umbrella that we use for everything uh, and with that you can support us at any dollar rate that you choose uh, right now you do have the ability to get custom cases if you want to support us at a five dollar tier otherwise you can can support us at a one dollar tier uh just to show your support and you get cool discord benefits if you are part of the discord service we are working on changing those reward systems up too as we move into some of these new things but for now that is where we are at and may announce new things in the coming weeks two months but with that said so i think it's time to move into this reader mail uh so let's crack things off with the first question sure thing so we have mr blake one of our good buddies he says what is one game series you'd like to see make a return Ooh, I feel like we've answered something similar to this before, but that's okay. Um, yeah, since I, I have a couple of answers. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything that immediately jumps to mind for you? Bloodborne. <laughs> I'm dead I feel, serious. I mean, I'm with you. I feel like it's a little too fresh Dark to Souls immediately three, say. Or Dark Souls. Coming back. What do you think the chances are that we see any kind of a From Software, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, or Soulsborne, if you want to call it, universe style game? Um, Does Garrison count? I don't know because what I mean more than anything is that the Dark Styles, um, the Dark Stoles, Stoles. 
I'm losing it today. Uh, the Dark Souls style level design and gameplay. Uh, so, you know, Bloodborne was obviously not Dark Souls, but it's close enough in design of Dark Souls, but takes a lot of fun changes with it. When's the next time you think we see an actual traditional from software made game like that? Or in your opinion, is Sekiro a close enough evolution again as to I would have to play Sekiro with what they're talking about and what you see of Sekiro I see elements of Dark Souls in there and from software in general because I think you kind of just can see their game design and, and level design uh, but them going far more vertical with it and also making like the changes of it being far more action oriented and a little bit less RPG oriented I think it's an obvious evo- or I'm going to say obvious I think it's a it's an evolution and I guess it is obvious to an extent but I don't necessarily Necessarily think it's meant to be a continuation of those styles i still think that there's a chance that they just wanted to take a break from that kind of remove themselves from that and go to something that's different speed which i think already was what bloodborne was bloodborne yeah. sped it up and then you saw that continue in the dark souls 3 where they sped even dark souls up a little bit which is i think i, I still stew on this and it's still every day whether or thing, not whether it was I to like, the detriment well no it's it's whether or not i like dark souls 3 or bloodborne more Oh, yeah. It's a hard question that changes on a daily basis. Well, one thing I don't think we've ever talked about a lot is where do you stand in comparison to the rest of the Dark Souls uh, fan base on some of the things that Dark Souls moving towards that Bloodborne style did away with? Like, uh, if I'm trying to remember, was it Poise that had no effect in Dark Souls 3? Yeah, Poise was a fake stat. Uh, I don't remember if they ever patched that or fixed that or not. When I did the Let's Play, it didn't feel fixed uh, to me. But... I will say that I, I've said it before that I think I'm kind of in the Dark Souls minority when it comes to liking two a lot, but I like two a lot for like nostalgic reasons almost, even though it's not that old of a game. It's just I've, I've spoke about it before, but uh, it came in a specific it time. It came in a time in which uh, I had surgery and I was playing, so it, you know it was there for me. But I don't know. It's I, I answered that as a joke almost that Bloodborne would be my my top uh, thing to see return. But when I think about it, there's not really a franchise that's lost on me that needs to make a return that already hasn't. We have Devil May Cry, we have Resident Evil Two, uh, technically on the heels of Resident Evil Seven last year. Um, I mean, we have Kingdom Hearts three next year, early next year, and that series never away. really went away. You know, it just yeah, it, it say, went to different platforms. Yeah, technically, it didn't even go away. Um, but yeah, really, all my favorite like genres are kind of here. I guess Final Fantasy would be good, but. At the end of the day, Final Fantasy fourteen is always there for me to go back and enjoy. Well, and of course, fifteen. So, and I think it's well, I'm obvious not for me specifically because I won't go back sure. and enjoy fifteen. Oh well, yeah, okay, I, I get that, but I guess I mean in the, in the way of a franchise coming back. Now, are you saying that more return in the, to form? Okay, that, that's what I had a feeling. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as franchises that have actually been a wall to some extent, um, that I think would be very welcome return. Uh, number one being Soul Reaver franchise, uh, or even the. Um, um, oh Lord, Blood Omen series, um, which is what Soul Reaver Legacy of Cain. That's what I yeah. meant to say. Sorry, I couldn't get it out. Uh, but the Legacy of Cain series, which is what Soul Reaver is, you know, uh, stemmed off from. Uh, but I think Soul Reaver specifically is a series I'd like to come back, be it with a re- reboot or a sequel. I think a reboot would be really cool with today's modern technology and what they'd be able to do with the original vision of the game and turn it into. Honestly, from a technological level, they did quite a bit that was pretty cool on the PS1 alone. Uh, but I think seeing that push to its, you know, to a maximum thought, like, well, what could we do with modern technology that has so, so less. Um, limitations on what we were originally thinking about? And I think it'd be cool if they could get the original cr- crew back together to do it. It's probably unlikely. But I think it'd be very cool. Uh, I think another series that I really want to come back and I talk about it a lot, and it's not been gone. Far, it's not been gone nearly long as Soul Reaver the likes, but I would really like to see Sly Cooper get its other chance. I think that it's a great series. It's really fun, uh, but it's also one of those things um, where it's, it's kind of hard to say whether or not we'll ever get one. Uh, the last game set up for a new one, uh, but I don't. I, I would prefer the, a sequel because of where the story left, but if they wanted to go towards a reboot at this point in time, then I'd be okay with that. I got you. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um because those are some old favorite classics that that people haven't that we haven't seen a form of since PS One, right? Yeah, well, I mean, Sly, Sly has been since PS Three. 
Well, okay, I guess my mind specifically went to Soul Reaver. Uh, now, Soul, Soul Reaver had a PS2 release, I think, for Soul Reaver 2. Did it really? I might be wrong on that, but I think Soul Reaver 2 came to Dreamcast, PS1, and PS2. Uh, and probably, I mean, PC, I would imagine. Uh, but yeah, when you think about that, I mean, that series has been, has been long gone away. And I think it got that Norgoth release, which was technically in its world, but wasn't really part of the series. And there was one that they were making for PS3 that had footage show that never got to actually release. It looked really cool. Um, but as far as uh, Sly Cooper goes, Sly Cooper on PS3 was a very pretty game. I mean, it looked really good and it was a great game. Uh, it was very true to the series in, in a way that still felt next gen enough. Um, and I would just love to see, specifically, I'd like to see Sanzaru come back and get to, the chance to continue on with their work. I mean, what they did with 4, they did the best thing ever, which was they took perfect inspiration in the sense that you could not tell that it wasn't Sucker Punch who made the game. And I think that that goes to show that these are people that really respected the series, respected what fans liked about it, and still had their own touches in a way, but it all felt like an evolution of what Sucker Punch was doing, and it felt like they had all the same charm and style that made those games so fun to begin with. Um, that makes but, sense. Yep. Yeah, I think next question we're going to do is going to be one from Facebook. Um, Josh Shoop asks, best button gaming? And just so y'all are aware, we normally keep the show very uh, PG and clean and don't cuss. Uh, we kind of go off the cusp uh, on, you know. I think we both have the same answer for this. Uh, it, 2B? I, it better be 2 Booty. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, 2B from Near Tomina is, is going to be my answer for the time being. Yeah, that's, that's um, mine. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that really just comes to mind, that springs to mind. I mean, Chloe in Uncharted 2 is up there. I'll give her that. Um, I think you played I'm Uncharted think, 2, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just trying to think of anything that compares to 2B in my mind, and that doesn't. Well, 2B gets shown quite well. I mean, so, yeah, especially that yeah. self destruct feature. <laughs> uh, anyway, on that. I think the, I got to start that game. I, I, think, I think that's definitely mine. Uh, you want to throw the next question out there, so? Sure. Thank you, Josh, for that question. Since the esports are considered a sport, what or should should they be in the Olympics? Uh, from our good friend Kiki. Um, no. Really? Yeah. Now, what they should do is a yearly tournament for esports that, to my knowledge, they don't do, but they have I don't follow esports closely enough, and I'd imagine you don't either. I think you follow it more closely than I do. Well, yeah, and I don't follow traditional esports. Like, now that's kind of like there's actual teams uh, that are – they're all fill, filled with people who are probably a couple years younger than me. They're all playing games like Fortnite and stuff. The last time I followed teams uh, for like MLG and stuff was back in Halo Three, so a decade ago. But back before it really made a back huge before, leap. Before, yeah, it, it is what it is in gaming now. Yeah, but I think it'd be cool to have uh, a yearly tournament in which uh, they are subdivisions and such uh, hosted for each genre. So first person shooters, battle royale, fighting games, stuff like that, and have it all under one roof. If they have something like that, I'm not too entirely sure. So you're almost going to say you'd rather, instead of it joining the Olympics proper, you'd rather them break off I'd and rather have them a make gaming their own. Olympics. Yeah, I'd rather them make their own thing. Just don't use Olympics. That's too that's too weird of a term. Like when you hear Olympics, you're thinking of athletes. And I don't well, like that comparison of athletes and esports. I mean, I could, I could see, uh, though I think that that line starts to blur a little bit depending on how popular VR and AR get moving forward. That and it's still, it's still a small subsect at this yeah. particular point. Uh, but I, even then, I would say that um, I think that... <sighs> I think that it's people don't realize that sometimes the physical toll that, that stuff can take on and how cool it can be. I'd, I'd say this: I think that it would be it would do a lot for games to legitimize legitimize them to an extent. Um, but I also think that I think it'd probably be best under you, right? Because there's so many different genres in gaming that it would honestly be better to pull it under its own umbrella and then let people who are better at the different genres of gaming compete, much like people who are better at different sports yeah. compete in their own sections in the traditional Olympics. I, I think that's actually a really that would be kind of cool. good answer. Yeah, and I, I think that like even having older famous people like um, – Mr. Sark uh, is one of them. I think is his name. It's been so long since I followed the scene. And then like the Ogre Brothers, they were really big in Halo and uh, other games. Uh, I think they were pretty big in Quake. But yeah, that would be uh, a very interesting kind of thing to happen. I would watch it. If it was like yearly, it was a big event. But you would probably end up I'd getting... watch sections. Because, you know, I think that people do that with the Olympics already. You watch the sports that you appreciate. Yeah, that, well, that's what, I should, that's what I should say. I'd tune into seeing that. Yeah. For me, it was it's one of those things that's... 
I don't like a lot of famous like Twitch streamers and stuff like Dr. Disrespect, people like that. I, I'm not, I don't dislike, but that's just not my cup of tea. So yeah, which I don't, would you really consider Dr. Disrespect on the competitive level? Is that what he does? Oh, 100% sure. I mean, I, I'm saying this for has, people who are listening. I'm saying this from someone who doesn't yeah, dude partake is, in this dude at all. Is definitely a very competitive person when it comes to video games. Like, I mean, I'm sure and, he's good because yeah. people don't want to watch people who are bad, but I also know that there's a lot to his persona, which yeah, is like some a, people watch him because he's funny. He's and, an entertaining person to watch. It's just not something I watch. And his, his history in video game development is also pretty impressive for what I know. He's like, he's worked on Call of Duty games before, before he's even started Twitch. Like, he's helped develop games. I could be incorrect on there, but I don't think so. But yeah, under one big roof would be kind of cool. Yeah, if, if that exists already, let us know because I'm surely I don't pay enough attention to esports, though I do respect the idea of moving towards it. It's just not it, when you think about the time that me and Saul have. Definitely, me with a family, it's a little different. I think Saul would even agree that you know I'd rather be on Destiny. <laughs> well, yeah, but but my point is, yeah, you know, when you have limited time and you're yeah, stretched that's what so I'm thin, saying. and then you I, have like, you know we have this, which is more of a passion project right. for us and something that we are really passionate about. So when the free time, I try to play the stuff I try to play. Exactly. Like I try, I try You're trying to, to play spend my time up. wisely in a way, and that would be spending my time playing Destiny. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, that's essentially what I do. Uh, but I'm going to bounce another question off from Facebook over here. Yeah. Uh, and this one comes from Mr. Josh Ayers. He says, how much would you spend for PS5 at launch, and how much do you expect to spend on it? Uh, so that's a pretty interesting question. Like, what do we actually think it would be? And then personal value, what would we think would be our max? I'm going to say $500 for both answers. I think... $500 is I what I expect it to launch, and $500 is the most you should pay for this console at launch. I don't care if it does. I'll say this. I ex Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's not going to do, it's going to do groundbreaking console stuff, but it's not going to do groundbreaking graphical and CPU power for anything else that's not on the PC market. And I do think that for the price that you're going to pay, if you're going above $500, it's just a waste of money. Well, or not even a waste of money. It's a bad investment. I'm, I'm, early. I'm still really curious on that particular part where you're saying you don't think it'll do anything groundbreaking for PC because it would be it'll really be groundbreaking interesting. APU stuff. Well, even that, but what I'm kind of getting not $600 at dollars worth. is that or five hundred and fifty dollars. If worth. we go back towards to what we saw uh, with the PS3 generation, where the PS3 actually was really competing against the PS the PC market. Um, Obviously, partially in the price uh, aspect, uh, but yeah. also into what its actual raw capabilities were in certain areas. Now, of course, there were other areas where it was actually pulled back a lot, like it's uh, really, really terrible RAM amount. But what it was doing in some areas, though, I mean... And this is true to a decent extent across the board, but PC gaming has definitely caught up and actually gone way farther th during this generation. Uh, but, you know, even when PC was making a lot of strides toward the end of PS3 era, you were still seeing PS3 games that were unmatched visually on the PC unless you were running really ridiculous stuff. So all I mean is that, yes, maybe it was groundbreaking. Um, now, still, it's not groundbreaking on the CPU level in that sense because there's always been incredible technology that costs thousands of dollars on the PC side. But but I think when you think about what consoles have done traditionally, that's PS, why, PS3 yeah. actually did compete against PC market at the time. Yeah, that's that's why I specified APUs. Yeah, and well, and that's why I think it's really interesting. Like you know, we talked in recent episodes about uh, Sony potentially doing some form of a help with uh, AMD and working with them on the Navi stuff, and whether or not that is going to see some special chip form on the PS5. And it would be really interesting if we actually saw the PlayStation 5 come out with something that is actually somewhat competing on the PC market, at least within the $1,000 and below budget range. You know, that yeah. would actually be really crazy because when you think about the launch of PS4, PS4 was easy to match. You can match what the PS4 was doing on a PC for a roughly the same price, if not a little bit more. Um, which still says a lot about what an AP you can do and what people who are making games for a specific console can do. But I think it says a lot specifically to what, you know, PS4 wasn't aiming to be as crazy powerful as what PS3 was at the time. But that also came with a smarter design of we're going to make a console that's going to be at this price. We don't want to go above it. We don't want to lose money on it because we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. We need to recoup losses that we incurred during the PS3 era and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as price goes on it, I'm going to agree that I, I would, I would spend $500 on it. I would even potentially expect to pay $500, but I think that they would also be really smart even for a slight 
slight loss because we're talking about major losses on PlayStation 3. But it, even if they were able to sell it at a very, very minor loss, um, like um, it looks like Xbox is doing with the One X, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe not anymore. Uh, but if they could sell it at a slight loss for still 400 and hit that price zone, um, since don't, we've already seen Xbox break into that 500, it might be a way for them to undercut Xbox in a weird way. But it also depends on the power paradigm. It and really does stand. because, like, even right now with the uh, performance you get on Xbox One X compared to PS4 Pro, you're seeing it better across the board. So it yeah. really, it, if we're a, if for we're a, a year next, later, for for a year later and a hundred dollars more, you're seeing a notable difference for a next gen console launch. Uh, I'm going to expect more for what the PS5 is going to have than what the Xbox One currently has. And I don't think that it's going to be $100 cheaper than what it is now. Oh, even, you, even, you in, mean, even in even in you know a year and a half, two No, are years. you saying next-gen Xbox or next-gen PlayStation? I'm talking about Xbox One X. Successor or whatever. No, no, no. I'm talking about the $500 Xbox One X. Oh, you don't see it dropping by $100. I don't see it. I don't, I don't see the PS5 launching at $400. Because, because of because of, of the X? yeah because of this because I highly if they launch it then they're gonna make a they're gonna make a loss for the first year and a half until they have a new console reiteration of that of the PS five yeah essentially and, when they get to the slim aspect yeah which is actually because, normally far closer to two years in and, and, and for to be fair to be open with everybody I'm going off these rumors about 4K 60 frames per second that have leaked because there's no way an APU is going to accomplish that for four hundred dollars. I don't know. I still don't know enough about that. No, I guarantee you the 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 casing and stuff itself. Uh, even though they're getting a manufacturer to cost and everything, it's just well, and there's and there's it's pennies on the dollar for them, but and, it's still and, and I get what you're saying to an extent, but I really think you got to think about how much small you're not having to pay for individual boxes of stuff, you're not having to pay for packaging on things. No, I, yeah, I get it. I'm buying just saying, PC parts is all different because you also have like a graphics card enclosure, I, but you don't. You need can't that. even buy an APU that could do. 1080p 60 frames per second on ultra settings on everything for four hundred dollars i don't even think that apu exists though because it's not a, yeah, it's, a Ryzen it's not Ryzen. necessarily needed on pc to hit 4k 60 on ap I'm, I'm talking about 1080p i'm, I'm literally going to oh, step okay. down yeah, sorry go ahead to say that there's not even an apu that exists that could do that for that price that can do 1080p 60 60 ultra I think across so. the board. I don't think any Ryzen chip can hit that. I, it, really, or actually, are any Ryzen's uh, even have APUs? Or is, or I assume there are Ryzen they, APUs, but I, yeah, I, there's, there's a, I, because I, I don't mess with APUs. It's not a brand new line, but it's a new line from Ryzen that uh, they launched. I think it's uh, early last year, or I mean, late, 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 late last year, or early this year. Um, and the name escapes me, but it's to it's to go with uh, it's to it's to compete with Intel. I could see that. Man, I know that. I'm going off. I know Ryzen launched without any APUs. Yes, Ryzen is a standalone um, uh, but CPU. There's something they've done now that's different from that. Okay. Yeah. I well, that's interesting. I mean, I don't know. I say 500 and 500 is probably pretty smart, and I would say that that's okay with me too. Uh, though I do think that there's still something. I think I think Sony uh, really did a good job keying in at that $400 price point before when Microsoft still came in at 500 uh, with the Xbox One originally. Uh, and I think they'd be smart to repeat that. Uh, but at the same time, if you get a better console that will last longer, I think it's probably smarter to do a hundred dollars more. I just, I'm curious as to what the, uh, I'm curious as to what the more casual, not completely casual, but the more casual, um, gamers, how quickly they'd want to adopt at the $500 rate. That's the only thing I that think, I don't know about. Yeah, I would think that because you know the, the first, casual adopters, though, that's going to be a very small and, group, of and people. that's later because at, at well, launch, no, well, by, okay, yeah, I, I should say that I, I'm thinking the way adoption is used here is early. Yes, is so automatically us, an early core, The core gamers that are going to adopt very early on PS5 are going to be okay with paying $100 more for a power advantage. Uh, casuals down the line who don't necessarily see the difference are going to be like, oh, they're both $500. Uh, and that's one of those interesting things. I would like to see Sony do the smart ploy of pulling in and being the most powerful console, even above whatever Xbox does next. Uh, and they were able to pull that off with the PS4 by just going to a DDR5 RAM, which gave them a lot of benefit and not having to have an ES RAM that's apparently difficult to program for uh, which is what the xbox one tried to do as a response uh for the lack of ddr5 so i don't know that's that's an interesting one but uh go ahead and hit the next question sure so our good next our next question comes from yet again kiki uh and he uh he wants to know do you guys think we'll finally get to see kingdom hearts if so what do you think it's going to be like and finally will you continue to follow the series after three so thank you again kiki for that question um so i think he's meaning in this sense for those who don't like, necessarily know kingdom hearts as a place 
uh, has never fully been explored. Uh, and we've never, we don't necessarily know that we've seen true Kingdom Hearts. We, that's one thing that the series hasn't necessarily tried telling us. We've seen different iterations. Um, so at this point... We have seen Kingdom Hearts, though. This is Destiny Island. Oh, is that what you think it is? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it was some kind of manifestation of their mind... Like, because well, think but, about but Kingdom it, Hearts seen, has been around forever. You yeah, know, that's the one thing that's interesting. But that doesn't mean because of this whole data thing that's going on. Oh, screw with Kingdom that. Hearts 3. I forgot about that. Yeah, I don't mind. want to go too far in for people who are trying to avoid Kingdom Hearts 3 spoilers to any extent. But I'll say this. I think that if they were ever going to show Kingdom Hearts, now is the time. How how amazing. I mean, it has to, right? Like you would think as a conclusion to the main. Uh, not uh, what's, What is this story called? Don't you dare say Cyber Saga. No, it's called the Dark Seeker Saga. That's right. It's always been called that. So, no, I knew that. But I'm just saying, um, if they change the name to something, <laughs> I'd be mad. Something data related. Data, uh, yeah. No, but as far as that goes, I think that I, I agree that when you're doing the end of something, and they said it may not be necessarily the last game for Sora. We don't really know at this point. And they said that it's not necessarily the end of the franchise. Uh, to answer the last part of the question, yes, I will continue to follow the franchise. But it's a franchise that has a lot of nostalgic value to me and a lot of long time loyalty for me uh, as something I've just loved and continued to love growing up. Um, but as far as whether or not we'll see Kingdom Hearts, like I, I think we both agree that we have to at this point. Uh, it would be a waste for them to not do it now. I, I am Because curious. when's the other chance that they get to? Yeah, because see, and, and what's intriguing to me is that visually what Kingdom Hearts looks like it's it's almost like one of those things that your mind can't comprehend if you try to think of what it like what it is because like you just really don't know like i have ideas of what it looks like and you know the only um, person along this entire franchise who's probably had an idea in his head is tetsuya nomura yeah. the director but here okay here's one thing do you remember back when they were doing uh interviews about the worlds and tetsuya nomura said that this game features a new original world that he's been wanting to do since the first game you think it's do you kingdom think hearts? that that's always been kingdom hearts I'm not sure because see, I, what my my version of Kingdom Hearts is the throne room in Castle Oblivion, like it's just very white. Oh yeah, with with, with really tall furniture, like furniture. legitimately pure white. Yeah, like that's my idea. I've However, always thought it was very interesting that Castle Oblivion or really the Castle interior. Oblivion already existed, but how the organization chose to use it because it's, it's, a, it's literally an opposite. It's color the exact spectrum. dichotomy of yeah. them. Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting for sure. I just don't. I just don't know. Like I, I really do think I have a fan theory in my head. I'm not going to get into that. I am curious about involving Destiny Islands, like because there's things that have happened the, since the first game that there's a reason we keep going back there. And I, I wonder if Kingdom Hearts is more... There is definitely importance to it. Because well, when you think about Birth by Sleep and the fact that uh, before the, Sora and them, yeah, well, that no, Ventus I was, I was, was there... No, 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 no. I was going to say nothing. Oh, that's, that's not a lot. Uh, yeah, that's not know, a lot. But, but still. Uh, but I'll cave. give you that, is that there's been... Well, and apparently, that goes back to... Destiny Islands apparently has some form of a connection, if I remember correctly, to uh, Xehanort himself. Of course he does. He was on the cave in day one of Kingdom Hearts 1. Well, I'm talking about as a child, like him growing up was there. Oh, well, see, I wonder, and my theory is just very short, clean cut, no spoiler theory is that Kingdom Hearts is an idea, not a location. That would be really interesting. Yeah, uh, I don't think it's a location. But, see, that would be really interesting if we learned that this whole time they were fighting towards something they thought was real just to no, learn right, that they're it was, fighting towards an idea. Well, like, yeah, but they think it's a place right now, and but then they learn that it's actually just an idea and that it was nothing. That would be a really crazy ending to this, right? Uh, but more importantly, I, one thing I'm curious about as to whether we do or don't see it, while I still think yes, they do say that this may not be, this is not necessarily the last game of the franchise, right? Well, or, right, is there Dark a fear? Saga. Is there a fear then that showing Kingdom Hearts now would make future titles in the franchise lose the allure of, well, what is Kingdom Hearts? Not necessarily, because I do think that you run that risk with any sequel style game. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd agree. Or saga style game. So I don't think that. I, I, what I'm trying to say is I think that you could use Kingdom Hearts as a namesake and you could move across from what Kingdom Hearts actually would be revealed for. Like, I don't think that it, it's unless it's some kind of saga altering um, information, I don't think that it can impact anything because you could plan around it. Or you could there, or well, you could do and it prequels. Would be, yeah, and it'd be well. Even then, it'd be really interesting to make a game that talks about Kingdom Hearts past this because they can show us Kingdom Hearts, but not give us all the answers. You know what I mean? They yeah. could give the answers that are pertinent to the storyline going on, but they could still leave. Okay, like a, a good uh, example to this is like when you're playing Destiny, and the whole time in Destiny, you keep seeing the Traveler, but we still don't know what the Traveler is. 
Like we see it and we know right. it's there and, and we get just enough we, answers to, to help with what we're doing in the moment. Like, okay, well, we know the traveler gave us light. We know the traveler gave the fallen light in the past, but moving forward, there's so much that we don't know about the traveler. And so you, they could reveal a ton more about the traveler and still keep parts of it secret. And that would, you could still carry yeah, on even the, ideas the mystery. It secret. Yeah. yeah. So like, and that's, that's what, I, that's what the darkness is, is an idea. But yeah. So good question, Kiki. I yeah, really good. enjoyed, enjoyed talking about it. All right, uh, go ahead and pull another one from Twitter. From Twitter? Oh, okay. I, I thought immediately you meant like Twitter, not keep where we have them all right now. Uh, our good buddy uh, John, he says, how do you feel about Henry Cavill playing as Ger- Geralt? Geralt. Geralt. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, the guy from the Witcher series. That's what the upcoming it's Netflix series, The Witcher. <laughs> he says, me, I am personally on the fence about it. Is it Ger- I thought it was. It's Geralt. Geralt of Rivia. That's right. I'm thinking of just Stalt. Uh, from just near from near yeah uh, but you know what he looks like an elf from uh from lord of the rings but then he again looks, you don't see any post-processing on him so i'm gonna hold my, which is interesting i'll give it that but i do think that from a visual perspective they went far too much like he looks too much like orlando bloom he and looks, legolas yeah he looks too he looks too clean so I, i'm holding all reservations until we see him if it's gonna be something like supernatural where all the monsters aren't, aren't dirty looking and they're very clean I'm not going to dig it. I'm going to be against it. I'm going to be very interested in how this turns out because I think that this is a great opportunity for them. And I think that Henry Cavill's a big name. He's a good grab from a name he's perspective. He's a good actor, too. And he's a good actor. And he's a good person Best to Superman sell the franchise. Ever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so when you look at it in that aspect, I think that he's probably a good thing for the project in terms of how much uh, how much notoriety it's going to get going into it and how much hype it can build beforehand because it might even pull people who aren't even the Witcher fans into watching it which may pull them to the games you know which will be very interesting um, I would be I'd be interested in that uh, but what I mean by that either way is that I I think that the Witcher makes a lot of sense to me to actually go and I actually think the Lord of the Rings does too I, I think the original Lord of the Rings trilogy is is one of the finest examples of taking high fantasy uh, from a different medium and, and pulling it into some kind of film or television medium The Hobbit didn't do near as well with no, that absolutely sadly not. Uh, but I think that regardless we've seen it happen and I think if you put it in the right person's hands that The Witcher is an easy go to for a really good series um, I, of course yeah and that's, and that's one of my favorites I'm just paying attention to audio levels um, Oh, you're fine. Um, yeah, I am too. But um, it's it's interesting because The Witcher, despite it being a, an amazing, I I don't know. It's weird to explain because it's I, a very wondrous game, and it's it has so many awards and 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 good commemorations under its belt. Uh, or commendations, yeah, yeah, commendations. Listen, it's twelve seventeen a.m. But um. <laughs> It, it has all this. It's just it's interesting that out of all the game series, or I, I wouldn't say out of all the game series, it's interesting Netflix picked that out of everything, out of games, out of books, out of anything. They picked that. Well, it's, and it, it is makes sense. The it's got books. a lot of hype behind it. Yeah, it does. And 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 to be clear, they seem to be taking stuff from the books, and there which are, the games also apparently did. Now, of course, they tried making loose, they tried I'm making them very, but loosely yeah. from what I've seen and heard. And I've not read the books, so Such I want to be clear about that. Well, there's people's ages they have wrong in appearing that the games have a little different as opposed to the books. Sure. So, which to help with saying, the narrative they wanted to try and work with. Yeah. So, but as far as I know, the grand idea behind the narrative is very similar. Like apparently, Dandelion played a major role in the books, and I, I, and they pulled judging him, from what I've seen him in Witcher Three, from what I played is he was very annoying he play well he acts at well yeah there's that but in uh the witcher 2 he acts as a um uh a narrator so he is in witcher 2 yes okay see i'd never played witcher 2 witcher 1 was a uh, complete g- ta- like dog garbage on, on, the, a, on the pc yeah it's, it's not couldn't, a great could, game couldn't cap my frame rate so it was, was probably, also their first game so i i, I do no, i give them i give them leniency for that oh, i yeah. probably had a thousand frame rate going in and their screen tearing I was watching a flipper book, and I, it was also the Dragon Age Origins engine, which is not a great engine. Sadly. No, and I could not use a controller, so I had to use keyboard and mouse, which had massive input lag for some reason. Weird. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a interesting one. Uh, but I, I generally think that that's it's a wait and see approach for me. Yeah, right now. wait and see. All right, I'm gonna pull one from Facebook. Then um, Josh Shoop again asked, "Who's your waifu? Guyfu? 
<laughs> which I've never heard. But you know, it's funny that uh, the other day in Discord, uh, Crash had asked, uh, "What's the male version of it?" And somebody said "husbando," which it I thought was husbando. a good answer. But Guy Fu is actually funnier to I've me. I've never heard that phrase, so, that so is I'm going to stick with Guy yeah. Fu. Uh, I think Guy Fu is very good. Um, um, I'm going to use the same answer from previous. 2B. Oh, 2B. Dude, 2B definitely. Like, but here, You could say there's 2B can be used for so many titles. Oh, absolutely. The best like, feminine character like or feminine um, star in a game, 2B. I agree. Best robot in a game, 2B. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you might have some competition from the androids in Detroit on that no, one. No, absolutely not. I mean, I still think that 2B is it, but I think other people, I think other not. people would argue. Then no. again, there's probably other mech games that I'm not even aware of that are probably in this li- in running. A robot. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, more importantly, I think that there is one that we should be able to agree on, or at least I know me and Joe because we've been, every time we get on Destiny, we talk about it. Uh, but I think here recently, my, my new waifu has been uh, Mara Sav in Destiny 2. Oh yeah, she Woo! can... Boy, <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that. I was going to make a raid joke, but I just didn't know where to go. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I, I think waifus are funny. I, I, I know some people just don't get it. and I, I honestly think waifus are one of those funny things, even from a joke level. Like, I thought all the people that were calling uh, the doll and Bloodborne waifu was hilarious because it's just funny to me yeah. that that's how they wanted to go with that. But, look, I mean, uh, I would actually say that as much as the, the game is meh from, and we've talked about that at, at length, but uh, I really thought, I, I really liked and was disappointed in the lack of character uh, development for her, Aranea in Final Fantasy XV. Oh, I was like, what she's game just was very, meh? She's just very very pretty but she's also like really badass looking and i think that's yeah, part of why you like the game Tubi. for like an hour and a half total and a, you know yeah she had such a small role game. sadly um but that's yeah that's definitely one I don't know if it's an hour and a half probably. i'm trying to think of other ones because those are just the ones that come immediately to mind i mean i mean technically luna freya of the same title oh yeah i guess but i mean th- i'm eh. talking about uh, like uh, guy fu though husbando uh cade six <laughs> okay from, Nathan, from, uh, Nathan Fillion can always get yeah, it yeah from a from a, a humorous aspect you know what I mean uh, I had this conversation the other day I like you know for some Troy reason Baker anything. people act like it's wrong for straight men to be able to look at a man and go he's obviously no, Troy, an attractive no, man Troy, Troy Baker is is is, is an obviously handsome man yes uh, it's, it's like I always say Ryan Reynolds it's not hard to look at him like when my wife swoons at Ryan Reynolds I'm like I get it I do too yeah I get like, it like yeah like come on now like I wish I looked that good but I don't so here we are has Ryan Reynolds like what video games has he been in? I don't even know if he's ever been in a video game, so I'm not going to go I'm forward sure with for that one. I'm sure for those crappy Green Lantern games, he didn't voice anybody. I really doubt it. I'm trying to think of other guy foods. I don't know. It's just you don't look at them that way. So, but I think from a from a from a humorous aspect, I think that there's that. I mean, I would I would roll through that. But Paranort. also a weird question. So I'm, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I'd say Cage Six is probably a good one. Uh, I can't think of any other games that uh, Nathan Drake. Well, I, I was going to say potentially him since that's essentially Cage Six anyway because. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Now, now I see what you're saying. Forsaken K6 is Nolan North. Except the the Ace and the Hole mission. All those, all those, all those. Those were pre-recorded. Yeah, I assume. Yeah, I'm un- good and for good reason too. But, I, but technically, I thought you meant because of not only Nolan North, but because Nathan Fillion also could play. Uh, oh, Nathan they're, Drake. Dude, they're great villains for each other. No, I know. But Even I'm from just, a like, voice, they're aspect. interchangeable at this point. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Next question up, though. I love this question. It makes me laugh. He says, "Hey guys." <laughs> back of hair uh back of neck hair round or square <laughs> from our very good buddy el chabib el chabib this is the great, hope- this is the most random question and i love it because saul always does this like hey ask us things that are not necessarily gaming related and you took that to the furthest degree i think i've well, ever seen i love it because he asked <laughs> such great questions and like he's never asked what i consider a bad question yeah not, not a lot of people have if any but like when I saw that and he was like, wait, let me clarify. And I was like, I didn't need clarification in the message, but it was fantastic. Uh, yeah, it was really so funny. Square, obviously. I don't, I don't know. Round looks so weird to me. It does. But I don't know if it's, I'm going to be dead honest here. I don't know if that, if an ethnicity change would change that. My hair specifically because of the way that it goes down. Yeah. I think that the square aspect works. I would look like a thumb with a, with a toupee. But I think depending on the way your hair is, like say that, you know, hair that's a little more, uh, I, I don't know how you necessarily call it, but you know, that's a little more coiled and packed. 
uh, kind of like yeah. you you met Thor, right? Blaze's brother, right? And he has that, and the, Blaze Blaze also kind of has Corey very, Matthews hair. From yeah, very World. very very tightly packed hair. It may actually make sense round because it's curly anyway, right? It's not straight. So if you rounded it off and it would match the curl, like the roundness you would look of the like curls, the kid from Bad Santa. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. That's a good question though. For me personally, when I get my haircut, I get it's, it. Yeah. yeah, I get it uh, squared off. So that's yeah, a, I do too. So it makes it makes sense for my head shape plus the style of hair that I typically have. Uh, let's see. Next question we have our buddy Richard Rivera. He says, "Okay, so what if the internet never existed? What are some good and bad points?" Um, I'm going to give you, in my opinion, the both. Uh, answers for both of these and it's gonna be the same answer and that's gonna be information the The lack of before and the now too much information yeah actually that's a great answer there was something and i'm not saying that ignorance like because everybody does know ignorance is bliss but i'm not saying ignorance is a preferred way of living but you know when you're a kid growing up you can't fact check something instantly so you almost took took what they said um, not with a grain of salt, but if you trusted the person or not. So well, and I think it gave life more mysteries. It did, yeah. Like right? now, like somebody tells me something, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, I should research that one day. But it, now it's just like I pull up my phone, and within two seconds, I know if that's bullshit or not. And then even then, it's one of those things that's. Oh, well, and there's well, still a little bit of mystery, right? Because you have to on the internet well, again. What, it's do you trust the source on the internet that's telling you? That's true. So there's that, but I but do think rare. for the most part most things like okay you know how you used to you could be like was that person in that movie and everybody would just kind of sit around for like 30 oh, minutes no, being dude. like i think so no, dude. now you just know because you can imdb it you i know? used to have this moment of like it, it wasn't clarity but it was almost a moment of proudness in which i was watching a movie and i'm like that looks like brad pitt but like i would look at him and be like or it could just be some guy that looks like him and i'd wait until the credits and be like i'd look for brad pitt's name and the second i saw him, like yep i was that right. was him yeah yep. Because there's no way they had Brad Pitt and another it's, guy that looked just like Brad Pitt. The, the, yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, well, one of the one of the things that is always on my mind in this is that uh, there's a kid from the movie Genius, and that was a movie when we were growing up about a guy who cloned himself and he made a cool version of something named Chad, and his name was. Chaz. Is that what that movie's called? Yeah, that Disney it has, movie. It has Emily Ro- or Emmy Emmy Rossum Emily Rossum. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, that's the same kid from Jurassic Park three. And I remember watching that oh, as a kid. Yeah. And I'm like, that dude looks like the guy from Genius. That looks like Chad. And then I was like, I remember it, 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 it rolled because you, when you watch Disney Channel movies growing up in our age, you heard their names constantly. You'd hear like, um, I just thought, I just, Eddie, no, it's not Eddie Brock. It's um, whatever his name is. The some, kid some, who's some, in... Eddie's Million Dollar Cook-Off. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, you always hear these their names repeated because they were, they were you know, promoting the actor and actress. And I always remember hearing his name. And uh, I do remember that uh, I, we waited because I saw Dress Park 3 in theaters. And I'm like, that's it. That's uh, that's the kid. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like 13, maybe 14. That's interesting. I'm going to pull another one from the Facebook. Uh, this one's also from Josh Soup. And it'll be our last one that was uh, left over from Facebook, which is... And actually a pretty fun question, Uh, though I'm curious as where we're going to go on this. I feel like we're going to end up brain farting. But let's see. uh, You were putting together a super group to make a new video game from anybody dead or alive. What game is it and who is on your team? So I think he's meaning this from a developer standpoint. What developers alive or dead at this point would you pull together? God, my air conditioner is loud. Something stuck in that bitch. (laughs) Anyway. Something probably blew a branch into it. But anyway, so uh, developers alive or dead, that is so distracting. <laughs> I wonder how bad the bike picks it up. <laughs> um, uh, so, so who are your people? I've already determined that from a directorial role in this because he's so weird and I would just like to see where his brain goes. Tim Burton. Yoko Taro. Same person. Asian. Asian Tim Burton. <laughs> <laughs> we need to tweet him and say, you are Asian Tim Burton. Asian Tim Burton. Um, but... I think that the way his mind works is so interesting to me. And the, and the reason I say this specifically is not just because I play these games and I love them, uh, though that is obviously a part of the reason. Uh, my reasoning is when you look at his interviews and the stuff that he actually talks about and the reasons behind why he ends up making the decisions he makes, he always have the, he always has very interesting ideas that are like, I wanted to see what happens if you do this aspect. Like uh, when he talks about certain games, like, well, you know, uh, every game you're killing. 
Uh, but I wanted to make a game where you go through and you kill, but then later you go through and now the killing has a context as to what you're actually killing and you still have to go through and do it, but now you're learning more about it and you have more remorse for the killing that's going on. And I like those aspects. Uh, I think that people who look that much into things are really good. I think that it would also be really good if, if you could do a co-directorial job. I think Corey Barlog and that him be together. Cool. Uh, be, and, and it would be interesting to, j- to jump ideas between somebody who's obviously looking at things from a more Western perspective and then somebody who's looking at them from a more uh, Eastern, Japanese, you know, centric perspective and letting those two idea sets run together and seeing what would happen. Uh, now, who knows if that team would actually work on that particular aspect, but I think that that's probably where I would start. To answer my question, I'm going to take a similar direction as Brett with two directors, but I'm going to throw a third name in there as Art because I have to have this this trio. But I'm going to have Hideo Kojima, okay, followed by uh, Hitotaki Miyazaki from okay. uh, Bloodborne Dark Souls fame. Yep. And Brett, you have a leaf in your hair. Um, <laughs> yeah, you really do. Uh, <laughs> but then uh, Junji <laughs> Junji Ito is the art designer. Okay, who is that, and what's he from? He is the uh, he is the famous uh, horror manga. Uh, director, creator. Um, you may he, he does the Uzumaki Chronicles. I've showed you when we go yes. to Dominion. It's yeah. a really like the one I, you can flip open at any page. And it's like disturbing art. Sure. Uh, for those that are interested in that kind of stuff, I highly recommend it. But so you're thinking a horror game? It sounds like potentially, yeah. So I think that that team makes sense for a horror game. You yeah, know, yeah. I think that they could create a masterpiece. I think you take the Bloodborne-esque inspired things, and even Dark Souls got some kind of creepy stuff, but I think Bloodborne's obviously the more creepy yeah, of the two. Yeah, Dark Bloodborne's uh, real creepy. But I think you do that, and I think you look at what uh, Hideo Kojima was kind of hinting at with uh, uh, you know, Silent PT. Hills and yeah. PT. Even though he, we technically would, we wouldn't have uh, Gu- I can't do Guillermo it. del Toro. I can't do the role. I can't. I want to say his name with the role on it, but I can't. Guillermo. <laughs> Guillermo. I, can't, I can never do the role. Um, let's see. Next question, though. We do have Liam, and he says... So what do you guys think of the moment at BlizzCon? The one in particular he's talking about is that when a guy went up to do a question for their uh, question part of the panel, he asked, is this an April Fool's joke? An out-of-season April Fool's joke. Out-of-season April Fool's joke. Have you seen that reprise for the Fallout 76 stuff? No, I haven't. (laughs) But boy, I love those Fallout 76 videos. Um, I mean, I thought it was funny because due to the nature of what blizzard did for blizzcon and the way they revealed uh diablo immortal uh, i could definitely see a lot of fans taking offense to that i do think that there was a lot more people who took offense to the joke than what the than the amount of people that were actually offended by the joke if that makes sense like i I feel like there were too many people that called that joke offensive that weren't offended by it oh yeah like they're like oh that's really offensive to developers but i really don't think i think the developers knew what they were in for well look put yourself in two in, in both people's shoes right i think that you can easily put yourself in the shoes of the people that were sitting out there for this announcement and the way that they went about the announcement was easy to go this is a traditional diablo on consoles because they waited in this entire build up to throw this mobile aspect in you know, it's like they, they knew they were trying to get the, the the hype they wanted to off of the get-go by just talking about Diablo. But I think that when you put yourself in the shoes of the fan who's sitting there looking at it, uh, this is a game that has never been very big on even consoles. It was really Diablo 1 came to PS1. Except Diablo 2 on PS2. Diablo 2 did not come to PS2. PS1. Diablo 2 didn't come to PS1. Diablo 1 came to PS1. That's what I'm thinking of. That's right. Uh, but Did PS- it come to PS2? Nope. Okay, P- I PS2 guess I just- and PS3 um, didn't have any of those. Uh, Technically, and, PS3. Or PS3 did. Diablo sorry. 3. But uh, PS2 didn't, and then PS3 well, I, got I, one very late. I guess late. I played Diablo 1 on a PS2 just using the PS1 disc. Must have been. Pirate backwards um, compatibility. But yeah. Because I remember that, thinking this game's terrible. <laughs> they moved away so far. Yeah, no, and Diablo 2 is actually a really fun game. Oh, it is. Um but when you look at that, what I'm saying is that this is a very PC-centric game that just recently got popular on consoles because of Diablo 3 finally coming to consoles. I wouldn't say consoles. recently popular. I will, I will say, though, oh, well, oh, specific on consoles. Yeah, I guess yes, you're right. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Specifically on sense. consoles. It's PC-centric and has been popular on PC for years. Yeah. Right? I mean, Diablo's always been big on PC. Diablo 2 lived so long because of mods and stuff like that. Uh, and people were very excited for 3, and it, 3 took a long time to be made and released. Uh, but when you look at that, I think the reason that so many 
people because if you remember the order in which these questions came i think the guy was probably already aiming the question as a you know just to get it out there but i think it got reinforced as the fact that he needed to say that whenever the other popular diablo youtuber came up and said hey uh, is there any plans to eventually move this to PC or console where people can play it? And when they came back and said, no, this is going to be a mobile entirely experience, you got to think about this. Their As response. the person who's out there, you, you, they're literally telling the entire fan base who play it on a specific system and feel most comfortable with it there, that they're not going to be able to play it where they want. And this is also a group of people, PC players. Blizzard's very more PC-centric than they are console, despite of course. the fact that Overwatch got very popular on consoles. Uh, but when you look at it in that aspect, these are people that most of the time, there's a lot of dissent about mobile gaming in general, but PC gamers are for sure not normally into mobile gaming. That's there's even more because there's PC, more of a disconnect there. PC is considered more of a hardcore gaming than consoles because of how much more goes into being able to keep up with running it and drivers and all these things. It's a more meticulous gaming and hardcore and passionate. Can it can almost be interchangeable? There. Yes, to an extent, and that's what I mean is that maybe these aren't people that play a lot of games, but they play the games they do play. They take very seriously and they make sure their rig is up to date for that. And I mean that's the way. I I view it. But when you look at that, I think it's there's that. But I think when you flip it around on the developer side of things and you look at what the developers were doing, I again, I think that they should have known what to expect. And I think they made a, fl- a fatal decision by not deciding to at least try and do the Elder Scrolls 6 style Diablo 4 announcement. Because here's what it comes down to. Apparently, it comes out to rumor and partially has been talked about even by, excuse me, Blizzard themselves. That Diablo 4 is in the works. Multiple Diablos and in the that works. They are, but Diablo 4 wasn't apparently ready to be shown, so they decided not to show it. But I Which think a CGI trailer like Elder Scrolls 6. Not even a full CGI. All you have to do is just show one environment art piece with the... With the, the look, they could have done that whole piece, right? They could have done all of Diablo Immortal and let people do whatever, and then right after Diablo Immortal, be like, and one more thing, and then just play a thing that has a Diablo hellscape with like maybe Diablo's head coming up and making like a roar sound or whatever, and then it just says, "Bam, four. Which is and cr- people would lose their mind, and is, you don't even have to show anything. It's crazy because Metroid Prime, coincidentally, four thing. did the same thing. But out of the three companies, this is Blizzard and Bethesda. Both also start with B's, coincidentally enough, uh, are some of the most hated companies this year because of these two instances. <sighs> yeah, though I think Bethesda has far more reason to be hated than, than of Blizzard. Course, yeah. Blizzard's is very much and a I fan think that, backlash. I also think it's 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 happened a little bit. It, it's it's faded quicker. It happened and it got a lot of uh, it got a lot of notice very quickly and then it faded. Uh, I still think that the biggest mistake they made was acting like this is a real Diablo game and not even. I think that honestly, the biggest damage control would have been them going. Uh, we, you know, currently we're focusing on mobile. Uh, future, you know, future plans for it to come off of mobile, uh, maybe down the road. But right now, we're focusing on mobile. Instead, they chose to do like I talked about. They chose to do this exact no. And so I think sometimes you have to know when to pull back and go, maybe we shouldn't give an exact answer right now. Uh, because they already knew how mad the, fan, the the crowd was based off of the reactions that they got. Yeah. Um, what, you guys don't own phones? And, and again, I think it's, that's exactly what it is. They they mishandled every aspect of responding. They could have responded, and that was a very snarky way to respond. And maybe it was deserved because the crowd were being kind of rude. But... You know, these are the people that pay for you to have a job, for you to be able to come here and have the passion that would pay ridiculous amounts of money to come to BlizzCon to begin with. So if you are you don't need to act that way towards these people, you know, it's, it's a very interesting paradigm between the two. But I think that, I think that, yeah, maybe they should have gone a little easier on the developers, but the developers should have also not been so snarky and weird in their responses. I feel bad yeah. for the guy who was up there. You know, I, I don't they know the guy's name. kind of him to the wolves. Yeah, but... Yeah, you know, it. I I do think that the response from the guy had just the, the right amount of sting. Yeah. So, anyway, next question. This next question I actually don't have an answer to, but it does come from our good buddy over on Twitter, Sean One Neo. He says, with the level of detail and passion put into GTA Five, with the continued success of Red Dead Two, if you could give Rockstar Games any previously failed game or franchise from any other studio, what would you like to see? Uh, what or uh, hold on here 
what would you like to see them give the rock star treatment? So what, what, like what basically uh, a, a dead or failing studio to get the rock star treatment of love and care that rock star obviously puts in their games. I don't really have an answer for this question. Uh, I don't really think that any game that I would think of would fit rock stars development or even style. Yeah. You it know, it'd be odd to see like bloodborne and dark made by rock star. Which, I mean, that's not a failed game, to be fair, but I no, get no, what you're I'm just saying an example. Yeah, it'd be weird to see. It's almost weird of a disconnect to think of a, a sci-fi game made by Rockstar, right? Like, any any type of game that's not a Rockstar game I don't know. I think that they've pushed weird. close enough to sci-fi with some of the dumb stuff they were doing in Grand Theft Auto V, which is more joking, like the aliens and weird stuff that yeah, they were hinting at. never became a yeah. thing, um, but unfortunately. But even, even then, I think I'm going to be in a weird opinion of here. I can obviously look at Rockstar games and tell that they care about them, uh, but I'm not in the majority of the people. I think that what you'd gain in world building and maybe storytelling, you would lose in gameplay. Yeah, um, well, yeah. Because I, I, that, I'm still of the mindset that regardless of the fact that Red Dead was good enough for me to finish. The Rockstar, like, charm almost of almost, like, it, it's there... It's and it's 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 something you get used to. It's something you can even ignore, but the clunkiness of the game, it's there. I don't think you can necessarily ignore it. I can ignore it. Like I, I after playing so much Grand Theft Auto Five, there are little quirks I see people complain about Red Dead, and it wasn't until I saw that complaint I was like, and I went back and played it, and then I noticed I'm like, oh, that is in the game. Okay, uh, like some Fair of the enough, weird then. steering controls. Um, yeah, but tapping it, X to run is the stupidest that's thing. That's second in the nature world. to me by now. So like that, stupidest. That, it's always been stupid. Well, now to me. It, do you toggle? Because you can toggle. Hmm? Okay. No, I changed the entire game to first person shooter controls. That's true. And I played the whole game in first With person. Click sticks. Which also, can I say real quick? What? Who in the hell? They call this first-person shooter controls, and it's like I said, modern FPS or whatever. And then acting like the controls gonna be the same. You reloaded with circle instead of square. You crouched with square. I was like, what modern FPS uses these controls? What was what was X? Because X in Grand Theft Auto Five, honestly, uh, I don't first even was stealth. I don't even remember. But there's not a stealth mechanic in actually. X, X may have been crouched. I thought it was square. But I don't. I'll say it might be crouch because that's what it crouch. was technically in Grethado. There wasn't really a crouch. But I mean, I don't. I think that that's my thing is that a lot of games that may have failed, I think that they were good enough in the gameplay aspect that I wouldn't want Grant. I wouldn't want Rockstar to take that over. And then also because I think that that maybe the games that you could considered failed that maybe would be able. And I mean, of course, this is talking about a world where Sony didn't own the IP. I think that somebody might try and argue that the order should go to them. But the order had great world building and had great story and, and and like lore and narrative and the gameplay probably could be helped but i think the gameplay that was there if there was just more of it was good and it was solid uh, outside of the repeated boss fight that was a mistake like we talk about yeah the uh, wolf but i think that what rockstar would give them most which would would be world building and narrative which the, the order doesn't need uh, in my opinion so i'd say that because you, you'd have to go it's gonna have to almost be a third person game right I don't think that I, I mean, you could, since Red Dead gave the ability to play in first person and Grand Theft Auto V's re-release on next-gen consoles, I still don't necessarily think that that is... It seems like they're heading towards that direction more comfortably, I should say. Yeah, I but mean... Not more as a, not of a standard. Playing the entire game in first person felt fine, you know, it felt preferable to third. Uh, for me, which is crazy because I don't find, and, and this is, I, I'm used to it, but I don't find their first person at, like, like fluid at all it's more clunky than third person to me that may be because destiny has spoiled me oh yeah uh, no going back sure. to destiny was very hard between the two but uh yeah i don't know it's a great question that i don't have a great answer for yeah that's, uh, I, sadly. I, don't, I don't really have a great answer for that either i'm sorry uh, our good buddy sean um our last question uh from kiki not in this episode but from kiki uh he wants to know in y'all's opinion what makes a jrpg good this a very very odd question, good Kiki, sir. This is a very odd question because, because I think, I'm going to say it's going to fit for the same thing that I find a game good, a good story. And if it doesn't have a good story, it needs to be carried by good gameplay. That needs to be carried by a good soundtrack. That needs to be carried by good acting. I mean, not acting. Uh, um, uh, what is it? <laughs> writing. I don't know why I can't think of writing. Good writing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that JRPGs tend to fail at least in one area, but 
uh, some of their charm is that they're not always perfect across the board. Um, because like you could say, you know, graphically speaking, most JRPGs are not amazing. You know, they, they tend to be behind uh, other Western games that are coming out and that are very big AAA games. Um, in that sense, I don't think that matters to me because uh, JRPGs tend to lean on their art style a little bit more, uh, which I think is in their favor. Uh, because it helps them stand out against other triple A's that are trying to do hyper realism. Uh, yeah. Because you see even games like final fantasy 15, that had certain moves that were trying to go more realistic. They still had a lot of flair that was obviously um, anime based to an extent. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, exaggerated movements and stuff like that. Um, but I say uh, first and foremost, I think we can both agree that story should almost always be good in JRPG. Of course. That's I think that's staple. my very first thing because uh, I think that most of the JRPGs I love fail in the gameplay aspect sometimes, and but it doesn't matter, and I remember them so well because of the way that their story and writing were handled. Yeah, and I think that's that's the big thing there is, this, is the four pillars of a, of a JRPG for me is reliant on characters, story, writing, soundtrack because yeah. jrpgs there's almost uh a staple of jrpgs is tons of reading uh, whether it's the text-based uh like, like their, the text-based speech they have but the biggest thing as well is is the gameplay sometimes can be clunky in a sense or even the battle system can't be my favorite but if the characters are uh, outrageous and wild you know it makes it kind of worth it yeah, I think, you know, the series that me and Liam go to a lot, and I think a lot of other people do, uh, is the Drakengard series. And I think you have the Drakengard series where a number of people with Drakengard 3 uh, weren't really impressed with the gameplay. It was okay. It was serviceable. They need to make a remaster of those. I would love or it. Or even uh, remake. But it's one of those things where you didn't necessarily care that the gameplay wasn't amazing. It was serviceable enough to move you through the plot points. And the plot points and the acting and the writing were, and the characters were so either well-written or so zany and crazy that you that was interesting hearing from them to the point that you almost didn't care uh, and it was like okay well it doesn't matter that the gameplay is kind of man and that the performance is uh, dropping frames occasionally because really what I'm doing in this game is experiencing a fantastic story and the fantastic story and the fantastic characters and the writing uh, and the soundtrack which is also another pillar of all Yoko Taro games amazing soundtracks uh, so I think that I agree with you the four pillars that matter most are there and I think once you get good gameplay on top of it I will say that if gameplay is so bad it can pull you away, but it's very rare. I think a game it has very, that bad. Very rare that JRPGs do that. Um, that bad. I, I think. Yeah. Uh, I will say this. Star, the newest Star Ocean had a weird visual glitch in it that I could not get past. I'll give you that. I remember. Yeah. Uh, and which, which is weird because that game like looks stun, good in other aspects. That it had when you ran. But the character models looked so good, but then the animations were bad. Yeah. Uh, but in a flip of that, the Tell series, and how I mentioned that it's been lagging behind for me this generation, is it's refused to age in any good way. The character models are rough looking. Uh, the animations are rough looking. The characters themselves are... They've always been kind of oddly written, but they're not moving forward in ways that I consider to be comparable with other games that have been going forward. Uh, and their voice acting tends to not be necessarily amazing. Uh, and their gameplay is a little stagnant. I think it gets to this point where they're not just that they're terrible, but the story are also the story is also so slow in those games lately that I find it hard to care for long enough and the gameplay is not fun enough to keep me interested otherwise that I just lose interest. Yeah. And I, that used to not happen with the Tales series. The Tales series for a long time was one of my favorites, and it, it just it, lost it. It carried it really, really well. Um, so I, I agree really with your four-pillar system. I, I like yeah, that. That's a good I need. A, I need to play Dragon Quest Eleven. speaking of JRPGs. I do, too. I um, really think I need to see that one through. Uh, but go on. Next question. Sure. Our good buddy Donovan, a uh, real-life buddy, says, What are your favorite genres in console gaming, and what games in said genre – have you spent the most hours on? So, Ooh. for me, I, it's I, it's it's almost a given to be first person shooters, but it's also it's also tied with uh, RPGs, and I really do think I mean tied in terms of both favorite and amount of hours spent. Yeah, because I know that you've had a long history of of first person shooters, but I know you also have a long history of RPGs. Well, I mean, like like if I if I'm thinking of hours spent on Destiny in this generation. Versus the hours spent on games like Final Fantasy XIV, Dark Souls, and Bloodborne, 
It's up there. It has to be probably neck and neck. Yeah, because Destiny is the only real first person shooter that I've spent tons of time with. Like I've played a, a lot of the uh, Call of Duty games at launch, but I didn't really stick with them. Um, you play maybe like thirty to forty hours at max. And- at max, I would say thirty hours. I don't even know if it's was that except for maybe Black Ops Three. I played maybe forty to fifty. Yeah, but the rest of that for this generation has just been low. I agree. I think that. Uh, one thing I'd be interested to see where you stand on it, and I think it also depends on how you rank the games. I would say a lot of the games we play end up falling into the RPG aspect, uh, but I think there's also definitely on my side, maybe a little less on yours. Um, and it depends on how you want to call them, but third-person action-adventure, uh, which is what I would kind of categorize uh, Uncharted as. God of War. Uh, God of War to an extent. Uh, I think God of War... I don't think God of War is an RPG. Don't say that. No, it, it's not, but it's okay. not... The, the thing is, this generation, so many games have started putting RPG elements in. Yeah, and I still... That they've steered, a, they've steered a little away from pure action-adventure. I still consider games like that pure action-adventure, but I do consider it to have a, 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 a elemental structure of RPGs. And I think that... Yeah, because there's with skill that trees. little and, structure, yeah, it does not make an RPG, though. If no, that makes and I, sense. I, I'd agree. And I think that there's, there's more to an RPG than just that. Uh, and I think that the more to the RPG route is... Well, you know what's interesting? Because I think in that... I, it, it gets weird, right? Because JRPGs are already different in the fact that there is... I don't know how you want to say them, but there's ARPGs, which can be JRPGs or not, which are action role-playing games, which is what yeah, the blow. Kingdom Hearts and uh, Final Fantasy fall under Diablo. Oh, wait, never mind. Diablo is uh, CRPGs. Uh, well, technically. Well, I don't know what you can... I consider them dungeon crawlers. Uh, a third-person isometric dungeon crawler. Uh, See, I, I love Diablo the same. But I would argue well, that Diablo no, is an RPG. Divinity is a true CRPG. I don't know, but I'd say that... Uh, w- would you argue that Diablo is an RPG? I, I would I, I would argue Diablo is an ARPG. I mean, I would agree, uh, but I'm still saying it, it's an RPG. Of course. Regardless of how it goes. Oh, no, yeah, of course. Uh, it's, there's, so, there's, there's the, the, it's so gear-driven. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, I would say Destiny is an RPG. I would say Destiny is tied with... An FPS RPG, to an F- Yeah, I would say, but see, that's where you get into weird things, because... Um, technically, 14 is an MMO, but that falls into RPGs, obviously, but... sure. It's weird. Well, um, you can be you can be an MMO without being an RPG, I would imagine, right? Because where, do they consider games like uh, Eve Online to be MMO RPGs, or do they just consider them to be an I MMO? Have no idea. Space flight simulator thing. You know what I mean? I guess it's the same as. Um, well, and RPG is such a weird thing, right? Elite dangerous. You're literally role playing. Well, essentially every game is role playing. You're playing the role of someone else. So how, when is the, and from a gameplay level and design aspect, when do you suddenly say that it's an RPG? Yeah. Because you are always playing a role to an extent. Um, but at the same time, I think like horizon zero dawn falls more under action adventure, but there are obviously RPG like elements. elements. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the same for God of war. In my opinion is that God of war is an action RPG game, but there is backbones of, uh, of RPG elements in it, but I still think inherently it's an action RP or it's an, it's action RPG at, at the, at, at its core, at its core. I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. So it's weird, but I, I, it'd be crazy. I, I can't, when I, the last time I looked up Bungie stats, it was, um, I forgot what I went to, to find out my destiny time, but it was like 600 hours total between destiny one and two. Yes, uh, wow. it was four hundred. It was four hundred hours in Destiny One, and it was two hundred and ten hours or so in Destiny Two. Um, no, it wasn't. I it was five hundred, one hundred. It was. It was like. Uh, it was like three months after Destiny One had came out. And I had pretty much stopped playing because Destiny I was, Two. Destiny mean, yeah. Two. Yeah, because I was specifically talking to Joe about how much I played. Um, but I remember that my total game time across all characters in Final Fantasy XIV was almost 1,000 hours. Wow. So technically I have played Final Fantasy XIV more than Destiny, which is nuts to me because when I look back on it, it feels like Destiny has more time in it. Well, do you do your thing where you accidentally leave your computer up with your character on on fourteen ever? My computer? Play yeah. On PS4. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I knew that. Uh, I mean, technically no. Like, fourteen. Does 14, it do the auto log out thing if you wait for too long? Like most MMOs do, where if you're AFK uh, for like 15 minutes, it'll go know. ahead and log I out. I don't know if I've ever been AFK in that game for too long. Destiny won't. I don't think so, because technically you're AFK when you're watching cutscenes. Like, if you can tell somebody's watching a cutscene in the world, because they'll have a little movie icon, they'll just be standing there. Yeah. 
Um, but Vince and uh, Kiki are talking about getting back into 14. You should get into 14. Even if it's just like three months. Man. That's $45. That's a lot of money. $45? For something I don't know if I'll be able to play enough to justify it. Because I, I also have they to have buy the game. Trial. They have a free trial. I also have to buy the they game. They have a free trial, though. You gotta, oh, okay. It's like Destiny. You gotta, we will see. The I base make, game is the base game. I make no promises. Around Reborn. By make, the way, I make no last promises. episode, somebody corrected me. I can't remember who, but thank you, Gentle Soul, for saying to me that Heaven's Word. Heaven's Word. It was yeah. the other one. Yeah. That was the big one. Uh, that was the, for, the Forsaken slash Taken King. I want to say it was Josh. It might have been Ayers Josh. Yeah. I think it was. Uh, speaking of Josh Ayers, he says, with Sony skipping E3 uh, next year, if E3 is a total shit show, will it be due to the lack of Sony or will it be due to the incompetence of Microsoft? Um, showing Microsoft going off of this year, it would not be because of Microsoft. If they have a show similar to this year as next year, they will win A3. Because this Nintendo definitely is not going to compete with that kind of show. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. Is I think that uh, I think that at this particular point in time, I don't. I mean, I think that Sony not being at E3 will obviously have an effect. I think it's for the people on the opposite side who are acting like Sony not being there will have no effect. That's obviously dumb. Yeah, it's uh, gonna have a big effect. E3, it's gonna have a big effect, and it's gonna be a it's gonna be a big positive. But you think about it, there are third party developers and even second party developers that come into E3 and they pay so. Or I don't know actually if they pay or they get paid. I'm assuming they pay Sony to showcase their products for. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. That's a good question um, um, but without without sony being there they're going to go to microsoft it's the one person to go to well maybe to and that, that that, i honestly don't know enough about that but what i'll say is this i think uh, with them not being there there'll be an obvious uh there'll be an obvious lull to the extent that uh e3 being open to the public it's obviously going to have an effect on the people who physically go to e3 because there's not a sony booth at all either not only are they skipping out on the show they're skipping out on the uh <clears throat> on the show floor as well so they're not going to have a conference they're not going to have a show floor uh when i think you look at that that affects the people that are immediately there but how does that affect the people who are at the um what oh no i'm just looking at levels oh uh anyway how does that affect the people who are actually uh watching instead of physically being there and i think that it obviously cuts some of the hype out because i think nintendo um, or sorry i think that the uh, the big 3 nintendo microsoft and sony tend to be very very hype driven and and draw a lot of a crowd uh, while the uh, the extra ones tend to have people watch them but there's not as much hype going into them uh, and i could be wrong this is all looking at things through what i see across the internet and how people respond i think that the people that get the most reactions tend to be the big 3 um, i think when nintendo makes a move and it's because there's hardware tied to it and there's investment in that hardware so people feel more towards it yeah. because when you see the stuff from the other manufacturers like well we already know it's going to mostly be on every console uh you know square has its weird moments where like octopath is a, uh, a switch exclusive but for the most part you know that most square enix games are going to be multi-plat and actually if anything most square enix exclusives are typically going to fall on playstation and pc as nature of them being smaller games right uh that's just how they kind of do things uh, that was true with dragon quest 11 as well um uh, so I think that in the sense of Sony not being there, of course, Sony's there by nature of any third party release automatically being on Sony. And then there's nothing saying that Square Enix or other publishers won't have exclusive games for Sony that they announce on their own time and their own stage. But they're still exclusive to even if it's just console exclusive, they're still exclusive to PlayStation. So they'll be there in, in heart and spirit and, and to an extent. Uh, but I think Microsoft obviously gets some leverage in the fact that they don't have direct competition in the same way. Yeah, um, totally agree. I would say that it'd be really, despite what you think about Microsoft's business decisions, I think that they showed this year at E3 uh, that... They proved you wrong. They won't be... Because uh, we still don't know about the business decision. And I want to say that, that I don't think that that's unfair uh, to say... <clears throat> that the as far as business decisions go we don't necessarily know how numbers work for games pass uh and we don't necessarily know how streaming is going to work for them moving forward that's one of their business decisions that they're rolling forward through uh day one on games pass is another thing that we don't quite know how it's it completely affecting games uh it seems like it's good because more people are going into it uh, but that may be them pumping more money into it to try and get it on its feet it's really impossible to tell uh until we've had more time under it uh, but i think at that extent Microsoft did a good show uh, last, uh, you know, E3. Regardless of whether most of the games were third party, it was a well paced show. It was uh, fun. It was so cool uh, I mean, It was solid. It had cool reveals, uh, and they had a good presentation. And I think that that's all that really matters. I mean, was 
previous Sony year still better than last year's Microsoft? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's something to be said when you have a lot of games to show from a first party perspective. It's hard to leave a, a manufacturer's conference hyped as much when they didn't show as much stuff that's exclusively for them. And that's just yeah. one of those things that happens. When you know it's only coming on that, it feels that much more powerful. And like, man, they really stole the show with this thing that you can't get anywhere else. Right. Uh, and, and Xbox has those moments. They always will. And they always, I mean, they always have. And it depends on the art, uh, the uh, <clears throat> audience uh, who's watching it. But I think that E3 falling flat, if it even does, I actually don't think it will. I think it'll have some, like I said, of an effect to it, but it won't be due to Microsoft. That's true. Our good buddy LGB has his last one question where it is, what is the longest continuous gaming session without major breaks you played? Mine was 12 hours on Final Fantasy IX. Thank you, LGB, for the question. Another good, one of those good LGB questions like always. Um, I'm going to say Halo 3 is probably up there. I played for 24 hours straight once uh, in Halo 3. Um, How many hours? 24 man like solid solid uh i mean we're, yeah so pee breaks and stuff are obviously obviously amazing. okay like like hot pocket runs or <laughs> like I, I obviously like doritos and mountain dew runs it was actually to, to uh, to, uh tostitos and mountain dew i don't know what it was about playing tostitos but they're like just a good like salty chip like it's weird it's like instead of a port- uh, potato chip i have a like a corn tortilla chip i got you but um if it's not that, I do want to say it was Final Fantasy fourteen. I think the second or third night I really got into it uh, last year, the year before, um, I had I had t- intentionally gotten off work one night at ten o'clock, and I got snacks and stuff to, and I was like, I'm just gonna play this game. I didn't stop playing until I think the next day at four p.m. Um, I did not sleep. That's the latest I've stayed up uh, in the past decade almost. Yeah, I'd say my... Or the longest, other than Skyrim. Last decade is quite a long time. Um, I would say that probably around eight years ago, I played RuneScape about... uh, I think it was like 28 hours. I'm not even joking, man. It was a long time. I was getting delirious by the end of Halo. Uh, I can only imagine what you were doing. Me me too. Uh, And I got off and went to sleep specifically because I ran through... an entire 12 pack of Mountain Dew Typhoon. This is back when the orange Ugh. one was rolling through. No, that was delicious. Uh, but I went I went through a whole thing of those and I had a box of cinnamon rolls off the side that I'd eaten all of. <laughs> and now you have kidney stones. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That goes to show all those years of soda drinking that I did. So that was definitely there. Um, See, I, I spent the night at a friend's house. And- most recent? Um... I don't. The most recent I feel like was it has to be Destiny Two for us to an extent too. I don't know because I didn't. There's not like a for sure timing on that. I know that one of the most recent ones I did was uh, because Kai wasn't born and I was trying to take advantage of the fact that I could stay up if I wanted to. Uh, the night that the order came out, I got home and I put it in and I played it all the way until beating it, uh, and that was essentially three hours. <laughs> no, that was essentially eleven hours. Uh, but uh, I, did, I did a little bit of extra exploring, so it was like eleven or twelve hours. See, um, I'm trying to think here because like major things still pop out in my head. Um, the night I got Gravity Rush, I played Gravity Rush until four a.m. Uh, so that was pretty late uh, for me. Staying up past midnight, and it's currently one o five a.m. here, but staying up past midnight is actually a really big feat for me uh, as I've gotten older. So. I typically stay, go to bed at midnight, or, you know, twelve thirty a.m., and then I wake up at eight eight thirty a.m. But lately with Destiny, I've been kind of breaking that, staying up till one one thirty some nights with some friends. But um, did you realize how late it was? Is that what you're doing? No, Hannah texted me. Oh, okay, but um, I'm trying to think. There was something Skyrim. I got home the night of. Oh, Skyrim. Yeah, that's I'm, that's one that was original too release. Long, that was like eleven hours for me. Nineteen so not hours. Too long. Um, that was a good one. Me and Blaze both got our. It was our final days at La Coretta. Literally, it was the final day at La Coretta. We we lost our job because we got bought out at La Coretta, uh, where me and Blaze worked, and we also worked at GameStop. We went and literally went to the midnight of our our last day. It was a uh, we we worked that day. Got uh, we literally the end of that day. They're like, well, you don't have a job anymore. We went to GameStop later that night, picked up our midnight release version of Skyrim, went home, and I played for nineteen hours straight. I think Blaze played for seventeen. Um, I can't. There's something else. I can't remember it. I don't know, man. 
But I, I, I mean, see if you can think of it for now. Let's move on to the next question. Yeah, we have two more questions left. Both of them are somewhat jokey, but somewhat short and sweet questions. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think what you want to do. Our good buddy Mikey12 over on Twitter, he says, "Why do you hate the classic game that is Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain?" He's this is obviously me. he's obviously talking about Brett because I love Metal Gear Solid Five. Yeah, this is aimed at me. Which um, I also think is a little more controversial for a Metal Gear Solid fan to say, but oh well, it's a good game. Uh, well, you think it's controversial to say that you loved it? Yeah. Oh, a lot, of, a lot of people, Metal Gear Solid fans, hate that game. And I'm, what's funny is I'm going to say this. I know for a fact that I'm not as big of a Metal Gear Solid fan as you. I know, which is crazy, and you hate it. And I'm well, not going to say hate. I'm not going to say I hate it. I think that it is bland in comparison to what the series has done before. Especially from a style and story standpoint. A- absolutely. I the think story the way, was, a presentation, that's what I'm going to say, a presentation still, perspective. That's the only Metal Gear Solid game I've ever started and this is including Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2, yeah. and Peace Walker, that I've sure. never finished. Oh, yeah. You didn't beat it. I, I forget I, about I never, that all the time. I, I, got, I got to the uh, Solanthropus boss fight, and I felt like that's where the game should have ended. Um, and I've heard that Metal from Gear a Solid. number of people. Yeah. I've heard that from I, a I'm lot telling you, dude, of people. I'm telling you, that's what it feels like. Even though the twist of that game is really good. It's very, from a canon, like a canon standpoint in that game, I really, really enjoy that ending of that game. But I enjoyed it from the comfort of YouTube because I did not beat it. Um, where I beat <laughs> Peace Walker, uh, Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2, and then... Um, how do you feel about this, real quick? He specifically mentioned that, in his in his opinion, five felt like Peace Walker on crack, essentially. Yeah. I from looking at some of it, I know that that's actually in story relation. It is similar. It is to Peace very Walker. similar to Peace Walker uh, story wise. But in terms of the rest of what it's doing, I disagree. In the no, way that Peace Walker it, implemented a lot of weird things. Peace that, Walker did, that, and I think that this game. But did Peace Walker implemented quite well. things weirdly because of the fact that it was trying to make sure the game felt good as a handheld game. Especially you online. could do everything quickly, but it felt rewarding. Peace Walker was the first uh, Metal Gear Online game, wasn't it? Uh, no, four had online. Didn't Peace Walker come out before 4? No, Peace Walker came out far after 4. 4 was a... Dang, I got my timeline screwed up. Yeah, no, Peace Walker came out... 4 came out, what, 2008? 7, I think. 2007 or 8. Peace Walker came out in like 2009 or 10. I, for some reason, thought Peace Walker launched like a year after the PSP did. I don't think so, no, because they had a number of other Metal Gear games before Peace Walker. Well, I know that. Acid was 1 and 2 were one of them. Um, Look, I'll show you right here. I think it's 2010. Yeah, 2010. That's crazy. My timeline is so mixed up in my head for some reason with gaming lately. But the online was very fun in Peace Walker. So I'd say, look, it's it's, it's for me, it really comes down to the way that they did presentation and focus on story. Uh, making story this backliner to the way that they wanted gameplay to be this thing. And look, this also comes from somebody who hasn't really, really played it. This is coming from somebody who barely touched it uh, because other people had it. I never owned the game myself, but I also got um, Metal Gear Solid uh, Zero, uh, Ground Zero, Ground Zeroes, and I know that ultimately speaking, Ground Zeroes was at least more of a connection to the way Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> Metal Gear Solid Five was going to play than than say Metal Gear Solid. Boy, 4. you remember what I did to get that game? Yes, I do remember what you did yeah, to get that game. And it was free like three months later. Yep. And uh, that was a to fun the face. night. Uh, <laughs> but no, essentially, when you think about it in that sense, I think that playing that game, uh, Ground Zeroes is what made me definitely go, okay, I'm, I know that I'm not going to like five because this is not rewarding. And then it was only exacerbated in five from the fact that the entire map was just a huge, boring desert. I'll, I'll it mean, did not have near enough terrain variety. For how big it was, it was the is is a it is a very close example. But it was better. I'll give it that. From what I've seen, it was better. But a very close example to what fi, uh, for what uh, Grant. God, what is my brain doing? Final Fantasy 15 did. Oh no, with it's a way big, better than Final Fantasy With a 15. big world that's pointless to be way as big as it is, better. and it's boring. Way better than Final Fantasy 15. I'll tell you this. I, I mean, I, I still say it's better, but in in terms of what it's doing against other games, it was still a letdown in comparison to other open worlds, in my opinion. I maintain the fact that if you want a really, really good open world stealth game, Metal Gear Solid 5 is the way to go, without a doubt. It does <sighs> great things for the stealth department. I think it depends on what you like in stealth, because I think that there's an argument, and it really depends on whether you mean more realistic grounded stealth. I which mean, is what I grand- mean something that's going to keep you on your toes and something that constantly has you change up because you can't go through doing headshots because then they'll get helmets. Yeah, I know. So then you have to change yourself up and go do CQC. And I still would say my argument, and I know this is something that you haven't played, uh, or at least as far as I'm aware you haven't played, I think that the Dishonored series is a very big... Uh, Why do you 
keep rival. saying. I have never played Dishonored. I'm t- Dishonored 2 is really yeah, specifically Dishonored 2 what I'm sure. talking about. Yeah, I'm not going to play um, Dishonored 2, I don't think, either. Yeah, it's a very good game, but I think that that's another game I've that heard a lot is of letdown. open world and it has very great gameplay from a stealth perspective. But you can also, yeah, we've, just we've, like Grand Theft Auto... We've had the conversation that I've played Dishonored 1 that I never beat it. Yeah. But for some reason, you already started that conversation with, didn't you say you beat it? I'm like, nope, did not have that conversation. Dude, I'm telling you, I'm so tired right now. My brain keeps saying Grand Theft Auto for some stupid yeah, reason. Heard so let's roll through You mean this. Red Dead, right? No, what I was Dang, actually... I was hoping to get you. I was like, yeah, I'm like, no, you didn't. You've been dishonored. The last question's fairly easy, though. Very quick. Okay. So we'll be done. Uh, Richard Rivero, our good buddy Richard, wants to know what our favorite color is. I am a light blue person. Uh, the color of my enemy's blood. Um, so I am a fan of Halo. Elites have... No, they have purple blood. Dang, I was going to say white, blue blood. <laughs> I was going to say something Runs crazy have like that. white, blue blood. Leeds have purple blood. That's true. Um, no, I mean, realistically, I was joking with that answer, but I really do like red. Uh, but realistically, I think blue is a very appealing color, and you probably notice that from the majority of my house being a uh, being on the gray slash blue sli- yeah, side. Yeah, I think I think for me, like a light gray, like like honestly, like a shade or two lighter than my color car is my favorite color. I oh, showed yeah. you the color that I like. It's like almost a it's a darker powder blue. Muted blues are really pretty to me, which yeah. is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, blues. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do like royal blues and stuff, but I think that that muted blue looks so sleek. And yeah. just pretty. I, I love blue. I love, like blue plus the spectrums of blue is the best. Well, I think blue matches with a lot of stuff, right? Blue and black looks awesome. It does. Blood, um, blue and red look awesome. Like it, Spider-Man? Think yeah, about it. You got yeah. some white in there, some a little bit of black. But yeah. Blue is a very, it, it's a it's a color that's, it can be complemented so well with so many other colors. I, and I, I definitely say blue is a good answer, so I'm going to stick with that too. I don't really think about it from day to day, but I mean, I, I like red and stuff, but I think blue tends to be my fallback. It's always a solid color. It's really easy to go with. So, yeah. So. All right. Well, that ends this very long, surprisingly, episode of um, our reader mail for <laughs> yeah, last month. Is, so let us let us know what you thought about uh, audio only. I think that the audio only for reader mail is kind of an interesting choice, but I think that you guys get technically better audio. It's better yeah. quality. I, so, we'll figure it out. We'll see as we, we make feedback. more moves. Yeah, give us feedback what we need, uh, and we'll we'll try and figure it out from what you think versus what it does for us and the benefits that we get. Um, so you know, hopefully, I don't have kidney stones anymore after this. Yeah, that's another reason we did it because so, kidney stones, stones yeah. in the kidneys. I feel like death, and I need to go pee now. So I will uh, talk to you all next week. And this has been Triangle Squared. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks to our patrons: Chad V, Dan Barber, Josh Jarrell. Mikey12, my name is Dan, Douglas Blow, Sean Santarude, Shadowist, Stephen Salazar, The Stonard, Travis Blow, Blake Popst, Eduardo Palomino. If you would like to support us, the link is in the description below. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.